think it probably meant a whole lot more to Paul when you, when you read his life and what he was before he came to know Christ, uh, truly our Saviour, and what he was afterwards. And uh, you know, he himself gave his own testimony about uh, what he was before uh, before he got saved. And uh, you know, when he was uh, giving testimony to the Jews and to uh, the governor, etc., and uh, and you know he uh, he must have looked back on that on when the Lord shone that great light on him on the road to Damascus in the middle of the day, and he must have looked back on that and thought how much, how gracious was God considering what he'd done to God's own people. Uh, especially when he became one of them and then he's out there preaching the gospel. And uh, you know, it's a, it is a blessing that you can't put into words to be able to just serve the Lord. And uh, you know, let me say that you know, serve, there can be no, no greater privilege and blessing than to serve God. And if God does that in your heart at some stage to, to serve him full time, then don't hesitate. Because you're going to miss out on the greatest blessing that you, that you can have in life. Philippians chapter 1, <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1 verse 12 through to verse 14, Philippians chapter 1 verse 12 through to verse 14, which reads, uh, But I would, you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy. Thank you for being able to, uh, once again today, uh, Lord, just uh, come before the throne of grace and, Lord, to seek your leading and guiding as we open up your word this afternoon. Uh, Lord, I, I just do pray that you would let the Holy Spirit again, uh, once again, Lord, to, to lead and guide in your word. May what comes uh, from, the, uh, from the lips of this ordinary vessel, very ordinary vessel, Lord, be what you want it to be. And Lord, I just do, uh, uh, Lord, commit these things to you. I thank you and I praise you. And I ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. So, uh, yeah, looking at Paul's passage, the passage that Paul's written here, these verses, I should say, that we've looked at there, written by Paul under the inspiration of God, I just want to think about what he has said there. Uh, and the, the, really the main thought is that first line of verse 12, but I would, you should understand, brethren. And, uh, you know, Paul is really, if you looked at what had happened to Paul from the surface of things, all of, that, all of what happened to him that brought him to that point, you'd kind of go, whoa. But, you know, Paul there is saying, you know, I would that you would understand. And uh, he's talking to the saved. He's talking to you and I. And it goes far beyond the believers in Philippi, what he's saying there. Uh, obviously he wrote, as we've looked at previously, he wrote to the church in Philippi, had a great affection for those people there. Uh, they were special to him. But what he is writing there, uh, God has used that because God gave us those words to him under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to write those. And so, what is written there is to you and I as well, very much so. Uh, brethren, uh, I would, you should understand, that when life has gone topsy-turvy and doesn't make sense with what is happening, I mean, yes, we can cause our own grief and our own problems in life, that's true, but, it, but supposing all things are well with your walk with the Lord uh, and <clears throat> life has gone topsy-turvy and, and doesn't make sense, with what is happening, has the Lord gone and, ab and abandoned us or given us a raw deal? No, he hasn't. No, he hasn't. 
And, and brethren, let me just insert something here which is not in the sermon, but it, it's just shooting from the hip. Don't let bitterness come into your heart when things don't work the way that you want it to. Mm. If you're keeping your life right before God, then keep your heart right before God. It doesn't matter what comes, uh, you know, Lord's, the Lord is still there and He's still in control. And that's what Peter, uh, sorry, Paul was saying here. He said, I would have you, sorry, let me quote that again, but I would, you should understand, brethren. So he's writing to the church of Philippi from Rome, where he was prisoner for two years in his own hired house. And this was one of the, the four prison epistles, as I mentioned this morning. You know, um, uh, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon uh, that he wrote and uh, from, from his confinement there in Rome. And uh, how did he end up in this position, in this position where he was a prisoner in Rome, albeit in his own hired house? Uh, for uh, for two years. Well, we know that Paul went to Jerusalem originally, uh, probably around 58, 59 AD. Uh, and we know he went there because of his burden for his fellow Jews, despite God warning him multiple times of the danger of going. Uh, finally, in Acts chapter 21, verse 4, he, he, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, said through one of the prophets uh, that he should not go up to Jerusalem. But he still went. He had such a great burden for them. And so he went there and, and we know that things went pear-shaped fairly quickly. And, uh, uh, and there was this great uproar in Jerusalem. The Jews, when he was found in the temple, they pulled him out of the temple and, and they were about to kill him. Uh, but the Roman centurions rescued Paul from them and, and took him safely into the castle. And, and, uh, and so the result was that Paul spent two years there in Caesarea uh, you know, just to the north of, of, uh, of Jerusalem, at the governor's pleasure, as they say. You know, if somebody goes into, uh, into jail uh, here in Australia, what do we say, at, at the Queen's pleasure or something like that, I think is the expression. Mm. And, uh, and so he was at the governor's pleasure there for a couple of years while they decided what they were going to do with him. Finally, Paul appeals to Caesar, uh, thinking that's his way to get out of, uh, or get away from the Jews that would kill him. And... Uh, and so after appealing to Caesar to get away from the Jews, Paul was sent under guard to Rome. His journey to Rome by ship was one of a shipwreck and delay for a number of months thereby. Uh, upon his arrival in Rome, the Lord had in his providence given Paul favour with the authorities. Uh, more in particular, you think about the centurions and, the, and the, the, the Roman centurions that had accompanied him and, uh, and other prisoners to Rome. Uh, and thereby had his own hired house for two years. But from what we read here, or what we read here, Paul states that the way all these things happened, God used uh, it and it resulted in his bonds in Christ being manifest in all the palace. Now that's a big statement if you think about it. His bonds were manifest in all the palace. Whose palace? Uh, well, Caesar's household. And uh, if you have a look over in, in Romans, if I'm not just about to get myself into the wrong place, but Romans, uh, this is not part of it, just to, just to give you an idea. Uh, where are we? Please, 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 have I got the right place? Uh, Romans 16. I've probably got the wrong one, but anyway. In Romans, anyway, uh, he greets those that are in Caesar's household. And uh, anyway, it's there in Romans somewhere. And I've, I can't remember the place. But anyway, sorry about that. But nonetheless, it shows in Romans that he greets those that are in Caesar's household. So when it says about, when it says in, in Philippians chapter, uh, chapter 1 about his bonds in Christ are manifest in all, in all the palace. It's talking about Caesar's household, his palace. And you stop and think, that's, that's, that, at that time was, was the Caesar that, after he, a few years later, torched Rome, as is believed, uh, he then blamed the Christians for that fight, the fires of Rome. That's the same Caesar that, was, that, that Paul had appealed to here. Uh, and while the persecution of Christians was not as fierce at that time when Paul uh, appealed, nonetheless, 
Uh, that was uh, to, to think that the gospel or his bonds were made manifest in all of the palace. That's an amazing thing. That's an amazing thing. So, uh, so my first point this afternoon, or our first point this afternoon is this. But I would, you should understand, brethren. That's a big point. It is a big point. In, in our lives, when things go pear-shaped, like I was saying a bit earlier, in our lives when things go pear-shaped, we do tend to just have that spiritual blackout and forget about God in our lives. It's so easy to do. And so here in, in these verses, Paul was explaining to the church at Philippi these things so that they would understand or comprehend the reality of the result of what had happened to him and why. That was, as he said also in verse 12, that it was to the furtherance of the gospel uh, which was Paul's calling to the ministry, the furtherance of the gospel. So thinking about that first point, but I would not, sorry, but that I, but I would that you should understand, brethren, we can have something happen in our lives that it seems is totally unrelated to the Lord or our walk of faith. Things happen. And, and we don't think about them being spiritually related. We don't tend to... We don't tend to associate the physical happenings in our lives with the spiritual reality of life. But the reality is the Lord, as the Lord gives us our next breath, He is always wanting to use our circumstances for good and for His glory. What does Romans 8.28 uh, say? And we know, and this verse was in Sunday school this morning, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Uh, not some things, but all things. God can use them. And, and yes, I know that there are Christians out there that will re steadfastly refuse to, to, to seek the Lord in times of trouble in their lives and they'll, they'll row their own boat and make a big mess of it. I get that. But, you know, God can still use uh, all those things for good. Um, you know, if you come across a Christian that's that got saved and then they had a bit of a shipwreck in their lives spiritually and then God got a hold of their hearts again and they went on for the Lord, they can, they can use that to help others later on. All things do work together for good you know, if we let them. And I want to think of an example of this in the Bible of all things working together for good. So back in Genesis we can see the account of the life of Joseph. Uh, you couldn't think of a much worse scenario than Joseph's. Uh, in Genesis, we find that his brothers uh, betrayed him by uh, throwing him in the, uh, in the pit because they despised him. And then they, uh, they, they sold him to uh, the slave traders that came along. And, uh, and so off, off Joseph went down to, to Egypt uh, and into slavery. Now, you, you stop and you think about Joseph. Joseph... He's in the pit. He's then sold to the slave traders when they go down to Egypt. You think about what's running through Joseph's mind at this time. Imagine what it must have been like. He was much loved of his father. He was his father's favourite. And he uh, had the coat of many colours and, and, and everything. And, and then here he was. His brothers have gone, we hate your guts and we're going to get rid of you. And they did. And so he's on his way to Egypt, a prisoner being sold as a slave, not knowing what tomorrow will bring. And so he gets down there, and things go from bad to worse. Uh, for in Egypt, he's sold to a captain of the guard who made him his servant. It's not turning around, it's, it's getting worse. But God still blessed him in that, to, that, to the point where Joseph oversaw everything in the, in the captain of the guard's household. So what does that tell us about Joseph? In all that was happening, Joseph kept the right attitude. He kept the right heart. He still had a heart of faith towards God. Because if he didn't, then God's blessing would not have been there as it was. He was still right with God. Then uh, Potiphar's wife uh, framed him, making false accusations of Joseph trying to rape her. Now Joseph finds himself in jail because of that. It's getting worse again. Betrayed by his brothers, sold as a slave, 
falsely framed for rape, now a jailbird. Wow. But did he but did he drop his bundle? Did he give up on God? No. From the first stage of being dropped in the pit by his brothers and sold into slavery, Joseph did not know what the next stage would be. Would he even make it to Egypt? What, what kind of situation would he find himself in? What did Joseph do? Did he fight? Did he struggle? Did he try to escape at any stage along the way? Did he try to, uh, did he try to uh, prove Potiphar's wife wrong? What did he do in jail? Again, we can see that he had a good testimony so that he became very trusted in the jail as well. So he kept an impeccable, godly character. Now let's stop and think for a minute. If you, were, if you experienced things like what Joseph experienced, how would your character be? How would you react? How godly would your character be in those circumstances? We, can, we, can't, we can't at this point see what was in Joseph's heart, but we can see the end, from the end result that, that he had the right heart all the way through. Now, finally, by staying faithful and true to the Lord, God raised him up to be the second ruler in Egypt. You know, all the, uh, the baker and the, and the, uh, and the uh, sorry, the, uh, what do you call it, the butler, with their dreams. Uh, and the butler ended up squeezing grapes into Pharaoh's cup again. And, and uh, it took a couple of years for him to remember about Joseph after Joseph had asked him to remember Pharaoh, uh, remember him to Pharaoh. And so the Lord lets Pharaoh have that dream, and, and then the butler remembers Joseph down there in the jail, and he goes, Oops, forgot. And so God lifts Joseph up from a jailbird to second in charge of Egypt by God giving him the interpretation of Pharaoh's dream. Let me just repeat what, uh, what Paul said there, Philippians 1.12. But I would, you should understand, brethren. But I would, you should understand, brethren. Don't ever drop your bundle when it comes to your testimony and your trust in the Lord. If you know in your life you have been living your life right before God and He has allowed these things to come to pass, allowed things to come to pass in your life, don't drop your spiritual bundle. Don't let your walk with the Lord suffer. Just keep trusting God. You say, well, it's so hard. I know it is. But you know, you stop and you think about Psalm 119. Thy word, sorry, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now you can't see far from a lamp down the path, but the light from the lamp will give you good light just for your feet, just around your feet. And sometimes in life, about one step at a time is about all you can feel you can take because you've got no strength left in you. Things have just bottomed out. The bottom's fallen out of your life. And you've just got to say, well, Lord, by the grace of, by the light of your word, giving me enough strength, I can take that one step. And God goes, good, that's good. Just keep taking one step. I'll give you some more light for one more step. Okay, God. Okay, that's good. How about one more step? Come on, here's a bit more light from my word. Okay, God. And little by little, God will get you through. And if you keep a good testimony, we too can be Joseph. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and in due time he will exalt us, as it tells us in the scriptures. we just got to keep trusting. Brethren, I would you would understand. That you should, I would that you should understand. Please, I would that you should understand. Tomorrow is another day. God is always in control. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. He doesn't change. It's us that have the problem. Oh, sometimes the, the, the trials are fierce. Sometimes the, the troubles are hard. 
where you feel like you're going to snap in two. Sometimes you feel like the, the bottom of your world's fallen out. Remember Joseph. Remember Joseph. I would, you should understand. God can see what's tomorrow. Can you imagine Joseph's shared to the butler that he was going to be restored to his position before Pharaoh, that he would squeeze the grapes back into Pharaoh's cup, and the butler's all happy. And Joseph said, I'm glad you're happy. But look, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been jailed wrongly. I'm not, I'm not trying to start a petition on, on, uh, on, on, online to get 100,000 signatures to present to Pharaoh to say, get me out of here. I'm just saying, can you please just tell him about me? They've been, there, they've been in jail for a while together, so they know each other's story. They know how they've ended up in jail. Obviously, the butler was something like, like, uh, like uh, Joseph, there for nothing, not, for no real reason, because he got restored to his position. So the butler gets restored to his position, and he goes, thoughts gone of Joseph. He doesn't remember. Two years go by, and Joseph's sitting there in jail. Oh, he must have forgot, I guess. Or he's told Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's not interested. Whatever. But he's still there. Joseph could not see the day before the butler remembered Pharaoh, when Pharaoh's had this dream, the day before that all happened, Joseph had been sitting there for a couple of years waiting for the butler to say something to Pharaoh, or had given up at least, one of the two. Joseph couldn't see what was going to happen the next day. You might say, but what if something doesn't happen tomorrow for my situation? Well, maybe it's the day after. Or maybe it's the day after that. But here we go back to that one step at a time again. God knows, just keep keeping the Word of God. Let the, 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 the Word of God be a lamp to your feet so you can take that one step at a time. One day at a time. Don't give up on God. Because He hasn't given up on you. He doesn't give up on you. He doesn't give up on me. He doesn't give up on any of us. He just wants us to keep trusting Him. Don't get discouraged. Don't think He's given you a raw deal. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth, good or bad. Keep going. I would. You should understand, brethren. We were talking just before service, before um, about what today is. Uh, I've got an illustration here. A fellow by the name of John, I guess it's Chirico, is how it's spelled. I, I've pronounced, I guess. He was called to be a pastor in America. Uh, before he went to the ministry, he looked after his mother, who was is quite sickly. Uh, when, uh, when he left to go to the ministry, uh, his, he had one other brother that, that was there nearby to his, to his mother, but he was an alcoholic. And so he was no help, and so he felt guilty because he left his mother there. He had to because God called him. And so obviously he, he trusted the Lord that he would take care of his mum. And uh, <clears throat> uh, after a while, uh, the Lord... So the Lord had called him to a different state, or a different place to do that in America. And so he's off pastoring a church somewhere else. Then on Monday, September the 10th, 2001, his mother passed away suddenly. The funeral was scheduled for Thursday the 13th of September. So, you know, just a few days later. And he was to fly out on September the 12th, Wednesday, to go to New York where his mother's funeral would be the next day. Well, September 11, 2001, the day before he was to fly out, was the day the World Trade Centers were attacked. Uh, it's the anniversary of it today. And, and this forced an emergency shutdown of all transportation in and out of New York. Uh, in his words, he became filled with guilt and anger over not being able to go to his mum's funeral can imagine. Decades later, this man became a prison chaplain. And in his words, he frequently 
uh, sits down with prisoners who have not been able to attend the funeral of a loved one who has died. You see, all things do work together for good to those who love God and, and are the call according to his purpose. And so his guilt and anger has been turned into empathy for these prisoners who experience this and is therefore able to give them good Christian counsel. Brethren, we can look at things and be angry and guilty and bitter and everything else and think, God, this is just not fair. But God's going, it's okay, just keep going. Yeah. It's okay. I, I'm in control. Just keep your testimony. Don't, don't blow your testimony. Just keep faithful. Stay faithful and it'll be okay. Second point. God used what happened to Paul for the furtherance of the gospel. And that's Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, which we've read, where he said, But I would that you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So it was not only in the palace that God used Paul's circumstances for good, but considered the hired house uh, that he had for two years where he was able to receive all that would come to him. That's, pretty, that's a pretty amazing thing. When you think about where he was, he's in Rome. He's appealed to Caesar of all people just to get away from the Jews in Jerusalem. And God has given him favour there in Rome where he's got his own hired house. How could he have such a favour? Well, you know, uh, King Agrippa, uh, who was the last person to hear Paul before uh, they sent him off to Rome, they both, he, both Agrippa, King Agrippa, and Festus, the governor, both agreed that there was nothing that, that Paul had done that, that should be worthy of bonds or anything else. So they, you know, they said if, if he had not appealed to Caesar, they could have let him go. But he had, so off, they, off he went. Now on the way, what happened? <clears throat> uh, there was on the, they're in that ship. There's a great storm. It comes to the point where it seems that all hope was lost that they should be saved. And the ship is really uh, in great danger. They've, they've chucked everything overboard that they could throw over, trying to, uh, to save the ship. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And so uh, uh, it says over there in uh, Acts chapter 27, verse 19, it says, And the third day we cast out with our own hands. Uh, understand the book of Acts was written by Luke. And he, when it says there, uh, the third day we cast out with our own hands, with our own hands, the tackling of the ship. That's Luke saying that because he was on the ship too. And with whoever else from Paul's party was there. And it says, And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. They've come to a point of utter despair in the sense of being saved. Now that's not to say that Paul and Luke or anybody else that was there with them, uh, with that party, were going, oh, thanks God. No, that doesn't mean that at all. It just means that they've come to the point where we're going, well, it looks like we're, we're going to... We're going to lose our lives this time. But then in verse 21, after a after long abstinence, in other words, Paul said nothing for a long time. Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and have gained this harm and loss. Paul had warned them before they set sail about, about the, uh, the danger. But verse 22, And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night and the angel of God, whose I am, and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, in the midst of a storm where all hope is lost. Great testimony. Thanks, Paul. Good on you, man. For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. And so, you know, Paul built up a reputation, a trust, uh, and uh, with, with, the, with the guards that, that, he, that were there with him, the centurions that were taking him to Rome and the other prisoners. Now, when the ship was, uh, was wrecked, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the shipmen and the, uh, other, and the other soldiers they were going to jump ship and, and, and abandon everybody and every man for themselves, so to speak. 
And, uh, and so, uh, uh, Paul said in verse number 31 to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, in other words, the, sh the, the ship crew, you cannot be saved. So then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let it fall off. That's the, you know, like the, the, you know, the boat that you could get to shore on. A little one. Life raft or whatever you want to call it. Them too. And then the thing is, what was, Paul, what was happening there? We can see the centurion saying, you better listen to what he's saying. He knows what he's talking about. Uh, he's, got the, he's got the hot line to God. So, Bill, so Paul, by the grace of God, has built up a trust. They had confidence in him. They knew that Paul was, was no threat. And so by the time they get to Rome, after the shipwreck a few months later, uh, Paul has got, he's obviously got a good reputation. God has given him favour with the authorities. He's got his own hired house for two years. Appeals to Caesar. His appeal to Caesar doesn't amount to anything. He's free after two years. And we can see from, uh, for example, the, the epistle to Titus, that he was doing ministry after, the, after that imprisonment. You know, all things do work together for good. If we just let God do, be God in our lives. And, and for Paul, it was for the furtherance of the gospel. And you know what? Ultimately, that's what it is for us too. God wants to use us to get the gospel out to as many people as we can. It's not just to live a good Christian life. While that's obviously very important and very vital, because our testimony says a lot, but it is to get the gospel out to the lost. Think about all the different things that God gave, all the illustrations, the parables. You know, the parable of the sower. Get the seed out. doesn't matter where it goes, just get it out. Uh, the talents that God has given, yeah, you can apply different. You, you can apply that uh, that that, uh, that parable to to a number of different scenarios in our life. But one of them is: Have you hidden who you are? Are you? It's not about being rude and crude, but are you loud and proud about who you are? Or is it kind of a are we a closet Christian? It's all for the furtherance of the gospel, ultimately. Third point. God will use a good testimony produced in a bad time. God will use a good testimony produced in a bad time. Philippians 1.13. If you have a look over there in Philippians chapter 1, verse 13, if you're still there. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in, other, in, in, and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. You see, God used Paul's good testimony produced in a bad time. Brethren, uh, I would you should not be ignorant. Sorry, I would that you should understand, brethren. I'll get it right sooner or later. So we can see not only in the time of his being prisoner in his own hired house for two years that God used Paul's good testimony in a bad time, but throughout his ministry. During the height of the storm when all was lost. During the time when he and Silas were whipped and thrown in jail and put into stocks, they sang praises and, and prayed to God at midnight. And God answered in a mighty way. God uses a good testimony in, bad, in, in the midst of a bad time. And fourth and final... A good testimony in a bad time is one of the most powerful encouragements to the brethren. Let me just say this to you, and in all honesty. You want to discourage your brethren? Be discouraging. Our attitude is a big influence on your brethren. If you've got the wrong attitude, it affects other people. We need a good testimony. And you know, the one that pops into my mind immediately when I thought of that was Trish Lloyd. Here she was, knowingly dying of cancer, and yet she'd come in and she would ask how we were. How's everybody? 
She was always smiling, always had a good testimony, right through to the end. She was always thinking of others right through to the end. What an encouragement. And you know what I'm talking about. You've all, I think pretty much everybody here, experienced Trisha's testimony in her last days. And we're just amazed at just how wonderful a testimony she had in bad times. How much it was of a challenge it was to me. I thought, boy, I hope if I get to that stage in life, before yeah, if the Lord doesn't come and I get to that stage in life, I hope I can have a testimony like hers. Honestly. A good testimony in a bad time is one of the most powerful encouragements to the brethren. Again, I just, just quickly with Paul on the ship... Remember, he had others with him like Luke, the, the beloved physician, uh, and whoever else was there. And in verse 19 and 20, you know, he was a real blessing. And he's there and he's trying to encourage everyone. He says, be of good cheer. It's okay. It's okay. Brethren, God through Paul is saying to us, he's saying to you, he's saying to me, I would that you should understand, brethren, God wants, us, wants to use our circumstances for the furtherance of his work. God will use a good testimony produced in a bad time and God will use a good testimony in a bad time as one of the most powerful encouragements to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't forget that. God wants to use us. He wants, to see, wants us to see past our current, current afflictions. Don't have that spiritual blackout when things come, when the hindrances come, when the, when the emotional highs and lows come, when, when the problems come, the trials come, or whatever come. Don't have a spiritual blackout. That's the time where, where we need the strong light of the Word of God on our lives so that we can take that one step at a time. Thy word is a lamp under my feet and a light under my path. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for being able at this time to, to think on these things. And, and Lord, uh, may we be mindful that a good testimony in a bad time is a powerful thing that you like to use for your honour and your glory. Not our power, but your power. Through your power you can get much honour and glory as you deserve. And Father, I just, Lord, commit that to you. I, I pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit of God would make us mindful of these things. Help us to be mindful that, Lord, it's all about the furtherance of the Gospel. Father, I just thank you for that. I, Lord, I commit these things to you. I ask and pray your blessing on the week ahead. Lord, help us to walk away from this Lord's Day with the challenge in our hearts for, the, for our lives in the week ahead, for a determination to have the Holy Spirit of God change us in some way that uh, you know we need. And Father, I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Lord bless you. Good evening.